This is Mike Huner again, and I'm going to be uh, working with you again on some of our volumetric calculations as we move forward in the training. Uh, so some of the stuff that I want to talk to you now is those specific volumetric properties that we're going to be looking at with our mixture. We talked earlier, I talked with you guys earlier about compacting samples and running bulk specific gravity and maximum specific gravity. With those values that we determine, we can now calculate some of these volumetric properties that are important to ensure that our mix performs as we intend it. So let's first talk real quickly about volumetrics and what that means. Uh, here's a diagram that you see in front of you that kind of illustrates the concept of volumetric components or the components of the mix in a volumetric state. So the image to the left, we see a, a, com, uh, a compacted asphalt specimen. So obviously it's, you can see all the rocks in there, but that's to just be able to illustrate those rocks are all in a compacted state. They're all interlocking together. They're coated with asphalt. It's all compacted together. So you can see our arrows are pointing to air voids that are in between those aggregate particles and asphalt coated uh, aggregate particles. So that picture on the left is a typical compacted sample. If you jump to the image on the far right, now what we're talking about are all those same components, those three primary components, aggregate, asphalt, and air voids, but broken up into their specific amount or volume that is in that sample. So the predominant component is our aggregate. You know, it's, nine, it's what, uh, probably 80 to 90 percent by volume of the mix. So you can see it illustrated on the diagram to the right how much of the entire sample is aggregate. Then you can see the asphalt uh, volume, uh, how much of that entire sample is, is, is asphalt volume. And then the smallest amount is that air void volume in the entire sample. So that just kind of helps you to visualize the three different primary components in the mix. The center diagram is another very good diagram to help mentally visualize one of those uh, volumetric properties, a very important one that we're going to talk a lot about, which is VMA, voids in the mineral aggregate. That middle picture, what it tries to illustrate, if you, if you take the, sand, the picture on the left, the compacted sample, and you could somehow magically suck all the asphalt out, but yet those aggregate particles would still be locked together, you know, in, in, uh, in contact with one another. So we sucked all the asphalt out. Now the air void spaces in between all the mineral aggregates is, is even more, right? So that's what we re mean when we say voids in the mineral aggregate. So in a, com back, in a compacted state with no asphalt, what would be the void structure in between those aggregate particles? VMA we'll talk about more, but it ensures that we have room to put asphalt and still have air voids left over. So some of the terms that we're going to be interested in calculating, those volumetric terms that we're interested in by, by our specifications. The first one, the voids in the total mix, VTM. This is also what everybody refers to as air voids. So when you say, I'm calculating my air voids, we're referring to the voids in the total mixture. VMA, I just talked a little bit about, again, voids in the mineral aggregate or in the aggregate skeleton. No asphalt, right? And then the third, the voids filled with asphalt, VFA. We'll talk about this but a little more specifically, but it, it's essentially how much of the VMA did we fill up with asphalt, voids filled with asphalt. And then the, the fourth one, fines to asphalt ratio. Some states refer to it as dust to asphalt ratio, FA. Okay? This is what is the ratio of the percentage of dust or fines, the passing the number 200 screen, divided by the asphalt content, and in more particular, the effective asphalt content. And we'll come back to that one and talk about the calculations for each of these. First, to be able to calculate these, we're going to have to talk about some other properties as well, define and talk about those. Those three values are the effective specific gravity of the aggregate, and notice the, the nomenclature there. So just like GMM and GMB, now we have GSE. So if you think about how we defined uh, the nomenclature before, G is the gravity, the S now stands for the stone. The E is the effective specific gravity of the stone or the aggregate. The next term is the bulk specific gravity of the aggregate. So its nomenclature is GSB, 
And then the final term that uh, our property that we're going to have to talk about and define is the percent binder effective. PB, percent binder, and the little e is the effective percent binder. And we'll talk about what each one of these are and why they're important. The first one that we have to determine is the effective specific gravity of the aggregate or of the stone. Okay? This is an important parameter and we need to know what it is because it gives us the relationship of the aggregate absorption. So every aggregate particle has some level of absorption. Some, it, some is very, very small. A lot of your granites, uh, maybe some granites here in Virginia as well as the Carolinas and Georgia, typically have a pretty low absorption. When I say uh, that absorption, I'm referring to water absorption. But there are some materials, maybe here in Virginia as well as some other states, some more natural materials, maybe some limestones and gravels that can be very absorbative and they can soak, soak up a lot of water. Well, if they soak up water, they're going to also soak up some percentage of asphalt as well. So the GSE and the GSB, that relationship gives us an idea of how much asphalt the aggregate can absorb. And that's important because if it gets absorbed into the rock, then it's not really helping us from a mix standpoint. It's, I like to say it's kind of lost into the rock. That's why when we later we'll talk about the percent binder effective, that's what's effectively coating particles and giving us durability. Okay? But we'll come back to that. So the GSE is the effective specific gravity of the aggregate or the stone. And here's the formula we use to calculate it. You may notice it may jump out at you a very familiar term there, the GMM. You see it's in our equation. So that's our maximum specific gravity that we just talked about earlier. Okay? So when we perform a maximum specific gravity test, we can then, after that, calculate an effective specific gravity of the stone for that particular mix. Okay? Some of the other values that are in this uh, formula, the PS, that's the percent stone. We know what the asphalt content typically is of the mix. Maybe we performed a, an ignition furnace test and we determined the asphalt content of the mix, or maybe it's a lab prepared sample where we added a certain amount of asphalt like we would do in mix design. So we know the percent binder, then obviously the percent stone is 100 minus the percent binder. Okay, so we have the percent stone, we have the percent binder, GB, that's the specific gravity of the binder. Now, typically, specific gravity of asphalt, cement, or binder is typically accepted to be what we show here, 1.03. Uh, some labs we used to use 1.028. So it's usually very close to 1.03. So for a typical asphalt binder, that's a very uh, common uh, value. If you get into a binder that's maybe heavily modified or it's got some uh, latex or something pretty extreme in it, then that value can change some, but always maybe reference your job mix formula for what is the value that we're using or the numbers we're using for GB. Okay, so if we look at our formula, you see we have our percent stone divided by 100 over our GMM, the maximum specific gravity of the mix, minus the percent binder divided by the gravity of the binder. Essentially what this formula is doing is it's taking that mix and breaking it into its components. 100% is the GMM, what percent is the binder. So we've got some numbers that we can plug in here just to give you an example to walk through. So here's a sample, let's say we performed a, a GMM test, we've got that value from earlier, the 2.494. Uh, the percent stone, we know that our binder content, maybe someone performed an ignition furnace test and came up with a corrected AC content or binder content of 5.98. Well, then we know that our percent stone is 100 minus 5.98 or 94.02. And then again, the gravity of the binder, we're using 1.03. So we have all the terms or all the values we need to plug into our formula. So if we plug those in uh, from, from those values, you're going to see here, and we'll carry out the calculation, you would get an effective specific gravity of the stone of 2.742. Now, as a side note, just compare that to the maximum value. The GMM was 2.494, and this effective gravity of the stone is 2.742. It's much heavier. Remember, this is an aggregate gravity, so it's just the aggregate. Aggregate's heavy compared to binder, okay? Remember, binder's 1.03. So our maximum specific gravity of our mix is gonna be between those 
1.03 and 2.742 because it's a combination of a heavy aggregate and a lightweight binder. Okay, so again, effective specific gravity of the stone, 2.742. Now let's look at how we now back calculate to get an, a, a bulk specific gravity of our stone. And the reason we're back calculating is a side note here. When you're in the field, running a specific gravity on aggregate is not a very quick test. And so a lot of states will utilize an approach like this where you can run an, uh, a max gravity very quickly, very routine thing to perform in the field, and then use a GSE with a correction factor like we show here to back calculate a bulk specific gravity of the stone. So that's the value we see here, that FCF stands for our field correction factor. This is gonna be shown on our job mix formula. So when the mix design is performed on this mix, for these, part, these aggregate components, they're gonna determine a correction factor, or a better way to think of it is the relationship between GSE and GSB, okay? That's that absorption differences, okay? So that FCF is gonna be given to you on the job mix formula. So once we calculate GSE, we, with our field correction factor, we can now calculate a GSB. So let's say that our field correction factor is 0 0.034, our GSE was 2.742, as we just calculated. So then our GSB is gonna be 2.708, okay? So again, that's uh, the relationship between uh, water absorption and asphalt absorption. Think of it as, as that difference, okay? So if we have an aggregate that absorbs quite a bit uh, of, of water uh, compared to the asphalt, this number, this difference, that correction factor can grow and be pretty large. Uh, if it's very similar to the water absorption, if it absorbs almost the same amount of asphalt, then that correction factor is gonna be pretty small and it's gonna be close, those two values will be close together. So again, it's the relationship that we need to be familiar with of asphalt absorption. Now, that we have talked about a few of those terms, now we can go back to those volumetric parameters that we're interested in. So that first one being the voids in the total mixture, VTM, that we also know of, or typically call air voids. Okay, so voids in the total mix refers to the small air space or pockets uh, of air that are in that compacted sample. So once we've compacted it into that compacted state, whether it's in the lab or maybe even out on the roadway, how many air void spaces or air pockets are left in that sample. Air voids are important. They're necessary in dense graded uh, highway mixes to give us additional pavement compaction under traffic to allow, I like to think of it as add a little bit of, of life or a little bit of cushion to the mix. So it gives it room to kind of move under the mix a little bit. Obviously it's not uh, visually seen, uh, but it just gives that uh, a little bit of that asphalt binder, some room to flow a little bit under compaction, okay? Most of our VDOT mixes, the range that we expect for VTM or for air voids, if you're in the laboratory compacting samples, that, that a typical VTM range is somewhere between maybe two and 5%, unless something really went wrong with the mix and we're really low or really, really high. But typical expected range is between two and five. For the roadway though, when we're out on the road, now we're talking about air voids that are a little higher in range, maybe five to seven and a half percent. The difference there is the laboratory represents not only the roller compacting the mix, but also the traffic that we expect to be on the mix throughout the design life of that mixture. So when we compact it in the lab, we're looking way out into the future. When we compact it on the roadway, we're at the starting point right after construction. So here's our formula for VTM, or air voids. This is how we calculate it. We use those terms we came up with earlier, the average GMB. We compacted three samples. We bulked, uh, we ran the bulk specific gravity of each one of them, and we averaged them together to get one value. We also performed a GMM test, a maximum specific gravity test, on that same mixture. It's important to remember, it's got to be the same mix. If we change the asphalt content, the aggregate components, then that value changes. So to be representative, it's from that same sample. So you can see the formula there where we plug in those values. So let's take some values that we came up with earlier. You may remember 
We averaged three bolt gravities and we got an average of 2.411. We performed a maximum specific gravity test and we got a value for that of 2.494. We take those values, plug them into our formula, walk through that calculation, you plug them in here, carry it further, at the end ultimately multiply it times 100 to move our decimal and you see an air voids of 3.3 percent air voids or VTM. So that would be the air voids of the average GMB. So those three pills on average would have air voids of 3.3 percent. Now the VMA, the voids in the mineral aggregate structure or the voids in the mineral aggregate. Okay, so again, if you remember what I talked about earlier, that's the air void spaces or the air spaces between the aggregate particles, okay, in a compacted mix, okay, in a compacted state, if you took all the asphalt out. So you've compacted it, you magically removed all the asphalt, and it's the air space between all those particles. So it represents or it gives us the availability or the, the room to accommodate liquid asphalt as well as air voids, so it's both of those. Okay? So it's important to have enough VMA to be able to get asphalt into the mix, but at the same time, not too much. So typically, uh, the higher the VMA, that obviously means we have more space ready, uh, available for asphalt, which means we can typically put a little more in and get a little better durability. If we get too high on VMA, we put in too much asphalt, we can lose some stability. So there's a balance. But typically, most of our specifications are, are going to give us a minimum VMA requirement to ensure that we have a certain amount of asphalt in that mixture to give us durability. So here's our formula for calculating the voids in the mineral aggregate. Uh, some familiar terms that we've already talked about. Again, uh, the GMB or the average GMB of the three samples. So we're using that same term again. The percent stone, we calculated that earlier, you know, based on the asphalt content or the binder content, 100 minus that, and we came up with our percent stone. But here's another term that we talked about just a few minutes ago, the bulk specific gravity of the aggregate, GSB. And you may remember we had to determine that using a correction factor off of our GSE. Okay, so now with the GSB, we can calculate VMA out in the field during production when we compact a sample. So you can see the formula if we plug those values in. Here are some of those values. The 2.411 is that average bulk specific gravity. Uh, the GSB that we calculated earlier using the field correction factor in the GSE, 2.708. And then the percent stone, we knew that our asphalt content was 5.98, so our percent stone is 94.02. So with those three values, we plug those into our formula. You can see I plug them in here, carry it out, and you see a value of 16.29%. Okay? Now this brings up a good uh, a point to make. Most of our specifications are going to require us to carry a value out to a certain decimal place. So always ensure of what value you have to report a number to. Uh, in a lot of cases, VMA is reported maybe to the tenth of a percent, so one decimal place. So in best case scenario, carry it to two so that you know you're being accurate on that. So reporting that is a 16.29, some cases a 16.3. So verifying your specification how many decimal places to carry that to. That third voids uh, term, VFA, voids filled with asphalt, again, this is the percentage of voids in the compacted aggregate, or the VMA, that we filled up with asphalt. So think of it as we have those void spaces between all those aggregate particles, how much of that do we fill up with asphalt and we leave the rest of it for air voids. Think of it that way. So it's an important uh, uh, term, not only as a measure of the durability, so it's ensuring that we have a certain amount of asphalt in the mix, but it also it gives us, uh, we've seen that it gives us excellent correlation between it and percent density. Okay? So VFA gives us good, I like to think of it as gives us good control over VMA not having too much asphalt or too little asphalt, a good uh, ratio or a good blend of, of asphalt to void space. 
So if VFA is, is too low, okay, basically there's not enough asphalt binder to provide durability, okay, and the mix may be pr uh, prone to fatigue problems, raveling, or other issues. If the VFA is high, or we're on the high side, that may mean that we've got too much asphalt in the VMA, right, we've overfilled it, Okay. Now that mix may be prone to over-densification, over-compaction, under, uh, under traffic, uh, lack of stability, maybe flushing uh, or uh, um, uh, washboarding, uh, some of those type of issues. So I feel like VFA gives us a good balance on VMA to make sure that we don't overfill or underfill that available void space. Here's the formula for VFA. Just as the name implies, we take our VMA, subtract out our air voids, VTM, and then divide it by the VMA. So it's, it's giving us what percentage of the VMA we filled up with asphalt, okay? So here's our formula. Here's some values that we calculated our, uh, already. Our air voids, you may remember, we calculated an average air void of 3.3%. We calculated an average VMA of 16.3%. So with those two values, we can calculate our VFA, plug them into our formula, carry out our calculation, and you see we have a VFA of 79.8%. Now your VFA requirements is typically gonna be a range, uh, maybe in this case, maybe it's a 75 to 80% range that we have to be inside of, and if that's the case, maybe we're on the high side there, we're getting kind of on the higher side, but we're in range. So VFA is typically a range of values that we have to be in between, okay? So that's voids filled with asphalt. Again, it helps to ensure durability in the mix. And then uh, the next term, we talked about this one earlier, to be able to calculate that final volumetric property that finds the asphalt ratio, we're gonna have to first calculate this important uh, property, which is the percent binder effective. Okay. So I talked about that briefly at the start. Percent binder effective basically is saying of our total asphalt content or our total binder content in the mix, some percentage of it gets sucked into the rock. And then some percentage is left to effectively coat particles and fill in spaces in that VMA and give us durability. So I think of it as effective asphalt content and ineffective asphalt content. I like to think of it that way. So here's our formula for calculating our percent binder effective, okay? And you can see it's a pretty scary looking formula in some cases, it's got a lot of terms there, but as you look at these terms, we've already defined each of these and determined values for each one, okay? So let's look at what's in here. Obviously our PB, that's our percent binder, that's our total binder content or total asphalt content in the mixture, okay? The PS, we already talked about, that's the 100 minus PB or the percent stone, how much stone is in the mix. The GB, because we're dealing with the binder, we need to know the specific gravity of the binder and we've already defined that as well as 1.03. And then those last two, those are the two terms we just talked about, the GSE, the effective specific gravity of the aggregate or the stone, and the bulk specific gravity of the aggregate or the stone. Again, remember I said those two values is, is basically what defines the relationship of asphalt absorption by this material. And every aggregate's gonna be different. Some aggregate can absorb a lot of asphalt, some aggregate absorbs very little, but it's gonna be all over uh, the spectrum when it comes to different aggregate types. Okay, so for calculating the percent binder effective, here's our formula, and we've got some terms that we've already determined earlier. So our percent binder is 5.98, our percent stone then is 94.02. Our gravity of our binder is 1.03. We calculated an effective gravity of the stone is 2.742. We back calculated to get the bulk specific gravity using the field correction factor and we got 2.708. So with all of these terms, we can plug them into our formula. So now when you're working with a formula like this, one rule of thumb to remember, always work inside the parentheses and in the brackets, carry those out, and then go to the next step. So don't get intimidated by it, just take it in its steps. So here's all of those values plugged into the formula. And we shortcutted it for you, but you should arrive at a 5.59. Okay? 
Okay, so if you walk through that calculation, work inside the parentheses, work inside the brackets, uh, ultimately you'll get to uh, the last step of subtracting whatever value from the 5.98, you would arrive at the 5.59. So what that tells us is, if you remember, the 5.98 was the percent binder or the total binder, and our effective binder is 5.59. So what that tells us is we have almost 0.4% of our total binder, 0.39, gets absorbed into the aggregate. So it was lost, essentially, is the way to think about that. So that's a pretty good a, a bit of our binder. Okay, so this is how we calculate our effective binder content or our percent binder effective. Now that we have that value, we can now come to that last volumetric property that we're interested in, the fines to asphalt ratio. Again, some states call it dust to asphalt ratio. But it, this ratio, this property, gives us an indication of the asphalt binder film thickness, how much is coating the particles, uh, how, much material, how much we have around those particles. That gives us durability, that gives us resistance to premature aging, moisture damage, gives us uh, durability in the mix. So we wanna make sure we have a proper coating around those particles. So to calculate it, we use two terms, two important parts of the mix. The top of the equation is the percent passing the number 200, or the fines, or the dust. So again, people use different terms there. But if you look at your job mix formula, you look at our total combined blend of the aggregate, when you get down to the 200 screen, it'll show you percent passing the 200. That's the value we're using on the top of the equation uh, uh, for this calculation. And then the bottom of the equation is the percent binder effective. The reason we use the effective binder content, because remember, some portion went into the, into the aggregate. What we're interested in is, is, think of it as the relationship or the effect of the amount of dust in the mix to the free asphalt that's coating particles. It has a stiffening effect on that binder. Some of that stiffening is a good thing and we need it. Too much stiffening can be a problem. Not enough stiffening can be a problem. So there's a balance of how much dust we have in the mix to how much effective asphalt that's left over. So that's why we want to use the PBE in the bottom of the equation. So let's put some numbers into our equation. If we look at our job mix formula, we'll say that our job mix formula, we have a percent passing the number 200 screen of 6.0%. So that's our dust content based on our job mix, and we calculated a PBE already of 5.59. So if we use those two values together, plug those into our formula, 6.0 divided by 5.59, we get an FA or a fines to asphalt ratio of 1.073. You can round that off possibly to a tenth, 1.1. So again, refer to your specs and your requirements on how many decimals to carry that out. But that would be, off the top of my head, that's on the higher side, but it's still in range for most, uh, what most DOTs are using for their dust to asphalt ratio. Again, an indication of that fines to asphalt relationship or the stiffening of the mix. It's an important parameter that we, that we want to ensure, film thickness, okay? So 1.1 for our fines to asphalt ratio. So with that, if you have any questions for your proctor, you can ask them for follow-up uh, for the rest of uh, information on these calculations. Thank you.